this episode was um, was really nice. We got to talk to Catherine Chevalier. So for Clive Barker fans, you may know her as Rachel in um, Nightbreed or uh, Tiffany's mother in Hell Hellraiser Two Hellbound. Uh, so this was a really good interview. Um, it, she was uh, she was a little difficult to track down. I mean, she's uh, Catherine Chevalier is no longer in acting. She's now more into um, she teaches uh, she teaches body posture and movement and like yoga and Pilates and stuff like that. So um, so Jose and I uh, had a really nice interview with her that was really kind of thoughtful and and uh, we learned some new things. So. So this was a good uh, experience. And anyway, this is episode 37 of the Clive Barker Podcast with Jose Leitao and I'm Ryan Danhauser and uh, interviewing Catherine Chevalier. So we had a little technical difficulty. Uh, it turns out that in Europe they had their daylight savings on a different day than in the United States. So... Um, so Jose and I were wrong by one hour uh, about when the podcast was starting, and in addition to that, we thought we were supposed to be calling her phone number instead of her Skype address. So we had we had some te- technical difficulties that uh, we ended up going straight into the news first, uh, and then uh, and then giving her a call an hour later than we had originally planned. Okay, so I guess first thing is congratulations to uh, to you and Sarah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you just got back from your honeymoon in Hawaii, right? Yes, 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 we did. It was it was great. It was like paradise. So um, it was really really cool. The temperature was wonderful. The water was great, and you know the place where we were was in the North Shore. I mean, it was really we really had a fun time there. And that was the Big Island. As, yeah, it was Oahu. I think that's the Big Island. Yep. Yeah, uh, kind of kept thinking about Galilee all the time I was there. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it takes place in uh, in Hawaii, right? Yeah, Part- yeah, in, in on Kauai. Ah, right. I didn't go to Kauai. Kauai is all is the Garden Island, I guess. And so I haven't been there, but it's all oh, you know, forests yeah. and jungle and stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I one of the things that I thought was really amazing was, despite being such a big tourist place. Um, it's not spoiled at all. I mean, you see all these birds and all these, you know, all this wildlife there mm-hmm. and all the trees and, uh, uh, you know, basically it's really well taken care of. It's very well preserved. I guess they have to keep it that way to make it attractive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't have like garbage on the beach or anything. <laughs> right. So everything was so, so clean and, and you know, uh, Con- uh, wow, how should I say this? Preserved, that's the word, yeah. yeah. I was pretty amazed that so many people were walking around, and there was not a single scrap of garbage on the floor or anything. That was really amazing. That is cool. Yeah. And thanks for the bowl oh, uh, yeah. with the boo uh, image. <laughs> that was really cool. I have it right there on, on, on a shelf. So did you guys swim with sea turtles or... No, but we did see a, a sea turtle uh, on the beach when we were walking around. We oh, saw that's this. That's right. I think you you t- you sh- shared a picture of that right on Facebook. Yeah, it was it was more than a foot long. I mean, it was I don't know how many. I, I I'm I'm not used to thinking about feet and inches yeah. yet. So I'm trying to figure out. Oh yeah, like a foot half, is a meter, or three feet is a meter. Yeah, this was like half a meter long. Okay, and uh, it was a really big sea turtle we saw at the beach. But what unfortunately, was it doing I, there? I think she might have been hurt. Uh, I, I, the staff of the hotel about the turtle. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they did anything about it. It's, uh, I, I kept seeing the turtle on the same spot every day. 
And uh, eventually I stopped going towards the turtle because I didn't want to see her dead or something. I didn't want to make sure... <laughs> I didn't want to find out that she had died. Yeah. But I stood on the same spot for like three days in a row. Oh. So, yeah. It was... Well, that place was called Turtle Bay. So, yeah. I guess you know, that's just nature. I think she had something on one of her f- fins. And I did tell the staff twice about the turtle, but, you know... I think they were treating the turtle more like an attraction. Like, when we found out about the turtle, it was because someone at the pool said, oh, you know, if you go that way, I think there's a turtle there. Oh, wow. I'm like, and we went there, and of course, there were people, like, taking pictures of the turtle. Uh, the turtle was, like, uh, eyes half closed, just moving her head a little bit, and, you know. But I don't want to get into sad things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a bummer. Hopefully the, hopefully the turtle was okay, but... Yeah, yeah. It doesn't sound too good. Doesn't sound too good, no. But that's yeah. that's you know, that's nature, also. I mean, we have to think sometimes yeah. they can be old. But uh, yeah, going to it, we were talking about the turtle. Yeah, that that, that thing is done. <laughs> well, the next thing in the news, uh, Clive Barker had has said that Odyssey Two project is going to be published as a book in oh, September. Hey. Wonderful, and it's probably going to have all the artwork as well, right? I would hope so. Yeah. yeah, I think that would be that would be a serious flaw if it didn't. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if they're just going to include the um, the the winning chapters and the winning artwork because if it's going to be that, it's that just going to be like, short. Yeah, because that would be just like an eight page, well, a sixteen page book with a page for art and another page for yeah. a chapter, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm not. It would sure. get published in in with some thing, some other things. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they'll use the runner-up chapters as well. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll keep following that. Uh, and then the next thing, Clive Barker put up an, a teaser image that said, If prisons, therefore liberty. Okay. Did you see that on his wall? I saw some things like... Um, if shores then sea or something like that and i think that if prisons therefore liberty and he said that was part one and part two is coming okay um i thought that was just like some kind of wordplay from aberat well it had a it had like a cover image some sort of a painting that didn't look like a clive barker painting oh i see okay well, let's see what that is, yeah. um, because nowadays there are projects popping up on Facebook with Clive Barker, like the alphabet thing that yeah. they're... Okay, I see he has three parts now. He has, if prisons, therefore liberty. Yeah. If seas, therefore shores, which is the one I, saw, I mentioned. Oh, okay. And if silence, therefore song. The last part, feel and free those, to share. And those all have different pictures? They all have different pictures. One of them has this picture of uh, this this um, silhouette of uh, someone's head, mm-hmm. but inside the head is like a landscape with mountains. Then, if seas therefore shores, it's a chicken in the Sea of Isabella when the Sea of Isabella invades um, that oh. little soda. I didn't even know chicken could swim. And then there is one that, that's like, if silence, therefore song, which is uh, this little kid with white pants sitting on top of a red cactus or mm-hmm. something like that. So, yeah, I, I think this might, this might be also done with uh, Alex, I think. Because mm. Alex has this, uh, this thing where he puts... Uh, sentences or words uh, in, fr- in front of some images and he usually posts tho- those on Tumblr or Instagram. Mm. So I'm not sure if he did this. Um, yeah. In any case, I-, I remember exactly the If Silence Therefore song from Aberat. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the If Seas Therefore Shores or If Prisons Therefore Liberty. Yeah, me either. That might be from something else that we haven't seen yet. Okay. So yeah, he's all. They've already shared all three parts there. I guess I only saw that first one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. So that chicken in the Sea of Isabella tells us that this is about Aberat. Sure. Yeah. There might be some unused poems yet. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I'm trying to remember what's the name of this painting with the kid sitting on on this red uh, 
cactus thing or rock or whatever it is yeah. or board. I don't know what this is supposed to be, a piece of wood. I, I remember this picture, and uh, I just don't remember the name of it. I think this is an Aberat or something. Hmm. I'm, try I'm trying to come up with it. Uh, wait, it's called Morning Tide. Hmm. Okay, it's called Morning Tide. This picture is oil on canvas. It's from 2000. It was exhibited at the Pacific Design Center in 2002 in Bird Green Fine Art 2011. Published in Aberat beneath the surface of Clyde Barker's Aberat. Oh, okay. I see it. It was sold by $3,000. I found it on the Clyde Barker Info site. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's pretty cool. I, I knew I'd seen it before. Apparently I saw this in the companion book. Yeah, but I don't know what this is from. It's probably just something that they decided to, you know, put up. Uh, right. Well, uh, the next thing is Hellraiser The Dark Watch number two is coming out this week. Uh, I, I got number one and I just read it last night. And it's strange. Um, it, it, uh, it sort of skips over some events that whatever happened after Hellraiser number 20... Uh, it skips ahead a little bit, and it, it starts off with Harry Damore is the new pinhead. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I, um, mm. that assassin that tried to kill him in Lost Souls, um, that worked for the Vatican, the Cantorist, yeah, shows yeah. up in in, uh, in the comic. Whoa, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. I have to buy that one. I, I haven't seen it yet. That's pretty cool. But <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not so sure about Harry Damore being the new pinhead, though. It, he, he looks different, too. I mean, he doesn't look just like, uh, you know, the Elliot Spencer pinhead or the Kirsty Cotton's pinhead. But, but uh, okay, well, I haven't been keeping up much with the Hellraiser comic book. But uh, what happened to the Kirsty Cotton pinhead, then? Uh, she, well, that's the other thing, too. They don't really explain, but she and, she and Elliot Spencer Pinhead are trapped in this sort of a, a little sphere that's like a memory cube where they keep on reliving the moment where Pinhead and Kirsty trade places. Oh, okay. Okay, who's, who's writing this stuff now? Brandon Seifert. Oh, Okay. And art by Tom Garcia, who he, Tom Garcia did the art on some of the other, uh, all right, the other you know, previous current Hellraiser. All right, um, yeah. So that that's surprising to yeah. say the least for me because I I wasn't uh, keeping up with it. So that, well, and that's, <laughs> they, there's a little bit of a jump ahead, and I suppose that as we go along, it'll explain. What happened? So yeah, I, I know that you mentioned several times the the quote from Clyde Barker that says that he wants to use different continuities for different media. Yeah, I'm just wondering now if this whole uh, Pinhead um, Harry Damore becoming Pinhead has anything to do with the Scarlet Gospels. I can't imagine that it does. Yeah, I know. It seems like I mean, at first I thought that that was some kind of a tie-in when he showed up in the in the Hellraiser comics, but yeah, he's. I mean, now with all of this, you know, pinhead swapping, and it just doesn't seem like that's something that Clive Barker would put in a novel. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, well you know, um, yeah, go out and buy this comic book, because apparently there's some really surprising and cool stuff happening there. Yeah, and you're supporting Clive Barker. and Of course. I'm still waiting on the, the store to open up, though. It's I, I keep checking that website every day, the real Clyde Barker dot com. Yeah, yeah. I keep checking it out. I'm really hoping to be able to buy some Clyde Barker official stuff soon. And I've been hearing there's some cool stuff in there and that it just needs to get turned on. Kind of like how the Occupy Midian website was uh you know, was all ready to go and just had to you know, at the push of a button it was gonna you know, it went oh, yeah. and had all that stuff in it. Sweet. Yeah. Um, the next thing, this isn't super huge news, but Aberat Absolute Midnight is coming out in paperback on September mm -hmm. 24th. Yeah. So I haven't, I don't really follow paperback news that much, but I'm surprised that it hasn't already been in paperback. The second one? Uh, three. Absolutely. Oh, three. But it came oh, okay. out in 2011. 
Right, yeah, so, that's true. So it's been two years. I, th- uh, I think of it kind of like a movie, right? The longer a movie is in the theater, the better it's doing. And yeah. probably the same you could say for hardcover books. The longer a book is in hardcover, the better it's doing sales-wise. Yeah, I guess, you know, it's, um, I think that originally what happened with Abrad number one and two, I think they, the paperback came out, like, was it a year after the hardcover had come out? Maybe so. Maybe something like that, yeah. Yeah. But so, so it's uh, been, it's been more than two years, because I think it was like May or June of 2011 when it came out. Yeah, it's still great that it's coming out, though. Uh, I saw, I saw, um, in Portugal recently, I saw a paperback for number two. Oh, and really? I actually posted a picture on, on Facebook about it because it was like, wow, I just found a Clyde Barker book on Portugal. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that, <laughs> because, was, that was the um, the UK paperback, right? Right. It has yeah. Matter Motley on the cover. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, wow, you know, it's I would buy it, but yeah. honestly, I, I prefer the hardcover much oh, more. Yeah. I mean, paperback. if... If you listeners are out there, I mean, it's totally worth it to get the hardcover. I'd get it now before it goes out of print. Absolutely. I mean, it's probably out of print now, but I, they're probably still available and not too hard to find. Yeah, like on, on Amazon or like eBay or something or just yeah. your regular com- bookstore, I guess. Yeah. But the, the hardcovers have the paintings in them, and historically the paperbacks don't. Uh, but yeah. if you get a trade paperback, those can. Yeah, it's like, why would you get Aberrat without the paintings? That's yeah. like, you know, that's like buying, I don't know, Doritos without the orange stuff. It's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, it's it's not, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I want to put that on the website now. Yeah, yeah, it's like, uh, it's like buying a comic book and, you know, not seeing the the, the, the images or the pages. Yeah. It's like... It's such an integral part of the story, the actual the actual paintings. That, I, mean, uh, I want to post that on Clive Barker's wall now. This, <laughs> buying what, that, without the paintings is like getting buying Doritos without the orange stuff. Jose Letao. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> that's that, no, that's that's good though. I mean, it's it's it, that that that's uh, that's a funny way to put it, but it's that's really true. Yeah, yeah. Basically, if you get the readers that the orange stuff, they're just tortilla chips. You know, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. there's no fun to it. Yeah. But yeah, you, you guys need to to get the the hard covers if you can, yeah. because one, they're hard covers. They're yeah. awesome. They're heavy. They're glossy. They're beautiful. Second, they have the paintings, and you know, if you like, you know, you need to get the hard covers. I mean, if you if you want just to read the story. You know, or you can get the hardcover and the paperback, yeah. which is what a lot of collectors will probably do out there. Yeah, I mean the 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 hard. I guess you could say the paperbacks without the paintings represent probably only half of the work. Yeah, that he put into the book. So, I would agree. Yeah, I would agree. Like I, I'm sure that Clyde Barker spent a long time doing the paintings. Mm-hmm. As much as he did writing it, so. yeah, and and just like just like the um, the writing, there's a lot of stuff that he does that you don't see because he throws it out or you know redoes it or you know and and uh, just like rewriting, he does a lot of paintings that just end up in the shed in the back of the house. Yeah, and I guess a lot of a lot of paintings never made it to the book just because they have to be selected and there is no room for everything. I mean, I'm sure if he wanted, if he could, he would have made like. You know, even more paintings per yeah. book. But well, then you would have, yeah. Oh, and there was that time when he said he he asked if anybody would be interested in a book of Aberat paintings. Mm-hmm. So oh, yeah. I mean, he must have been really thinking like what you just said that you know that there's so many that he he probably felt bad that there's so many that he couldn't put in just because it didn't make sense to have you know three paintings after each page or whatever. Right, but I'm still imagining. How big would a book of Abrad paintings be? Because Holy cow, I mean, yeah. gosh, uh, he has how many? I mean, per book he makes like two hundred paintings or something yeah. like that. So I'm sure that right now he has hundreds and hundreds of paintings in his, you know, uh, in his um, uh, studio. Right. I mean, you saw them, right? I mean, you saw yeah. he even has like a tent or something outside where he keeps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because funny. there's no room. And my, my realtor brain was like, oh, my God, you can't leave this out in the weather. Yeah. But, you know, it's like I'm used to Alaska. 
Yeah, and that's California. Like yeah. probably the canyons where where he lives, it only rains like maybe two weeks out of every year or something. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. So, uh, on uh, from our website um, on the the when we talked about the Hellbound Heart, uh, mm-hmm. W U S was his name on there. Wuss. Or okay. Wuss. Said mm-hmm. thank you for an interesting, in-depth discussion of this great novella and parts of the movie which it is based upon, which is based upon it. You might mm. be interested in hearing the horror, etc. podcast's opinion on the Hellraiser movie franchise. So uh, I went and looked on iTunes, and he's got a good like four episodes of his podcast about Hellraiser. All right. So there's like uh, there's like a Hellraiser commentary. And then he's got Hellraiser Retrospective Part 2, Hellraiser Retrospective Part 3, and Hellraiser and Addendum. Oh, wow. So I'm looking at it like right now, yeah. Yeah, I meant to, if it was one podcast, I would have listened to it by now. I've downloaded them all, and I do plan on listening, but it's that's like a good seven hours worth of stuff. Oh, my God, really? Yeah. Yeah, podcasts tend to go on for a little bit, yeah. especially if you're talking about something that you love. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we know that for a fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then our next one on that same post uh, was from Nicholas Vince. Wow. Hey. Yeah. He said, hi, guys. Interesting chat about Hellbound. I think you meant Hell- Hellbound Heart. Uh, mm-hmm. Thought you might like to know a piece of trivia about Lost Souls. It originally appeared in London's Time Out magazine, and I was an early reader of this one, as Clive asked me to type up his manuscript, the one and only oh. time I did this. Oh, wow. So that, that's well, cool. thanks. Yeah, thanks for letting us know this little piece of trivia, yeah. Nick, Nicholas Vince. That's great. Yeah, <clears throat> I suppose I suppose magazines probably don't want handwritten submissions. Yeah, <laughs> especially Clive Barker's handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Th- thanks a lot for for letting us know. Yeah. So yeah. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. You know, and and uh, it seems like that short story um, keeps popping up. Lost Souls. Yeah, it's like I said, it's it's a, a story that most of us have only read online, but still, it establishes a lot of things for for Harry Demore. It establishes a lot of characters, like uh, like the the blind psychic um, Norma Payne. Yeah. Norma Payne. Um, it it Chat Chat and you yeah. know Harry Demore. Chat Chat was mentioned again in the Hellraiser comic too, and. And then the Cankerist, you know, just came up in the Hellraiser comic like we were talking about. Yeah. So they, 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 it seems like they've gone back to that little story and they're starting to expand upon it, which is great. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, I think that Clive really did a, a, a great little story with, with Lost Souls that I would like to see more. And that's why I was so excited when we found out that the Scarlet Gospels were going to be involving Harry the Moor and, uh, and Cenobites. So, cause that was yeah. probably apart from, well, I think I might've read <clears throat> lost souls before I read the great and secret show and Everville. So that was probably my first introduction to the character of Harry the Moor. Was, was lost souls. Yeah. I think mine was, um, Mine was the last illusion. Oh yeah, right. Oh, I keep forgetting about that. Of course, yeah. Of course, that was my first introduction, and then the second one was Lost Souls, and then I saw, I read The Great and Secret Show and yeah. Everville, and, and he saw shows the up of- in the end of Great and Secret Show, and then he's more prominent in Everville. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, we whenever we discuss, I'm looking forward to us discussing the Great and Secret Show, the books of the art, because there's a lot of good stuff there that that we can discuss, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like the Reef and uh, Tesla, and all the the things involving Harry Damore and uh, the the golden eyed demons that appear from beyond uh, our world. That all sounds terribly exciting. And, um, you know, I mean, we have so much stuff. I mean, we're just scratching the surface of the novel. I mean, we talk about Damnation Game, The Hellbound Heart, and The Weave World to Come. And then, wow, there's so many things. There's like Imagica, Thief of Always. I I think Imagica is probably going to be several episodes long. (laughs) I agree. Yeah, that's the best way to do it because we wouldn't do it justice otherwise. Yeah, yeah. 
and, you know, and, uh, and and also the more of these interviews that we do, the more people we get, and so, yeah, which is great. But it also means that we're doing less, you know, because of time, we're doing less episodes about specific, you know, topics. Yeah, but I think you know they've they've, they've been pretty interesting so far yeah. for listeners. So that that's pretty cool. Yeah. And um, you know, hopefully, when we get to Aberat, we might be talking about the full. <laughs> full series that would be great yeah yeah that'd be wonderful um so yeah let's um let's see let's see what happens in the future mm-hmm. i mean there's still there's still books to come like the candle in the cloud the Abrat the price of dreams Abrat the eternal yeah. hopefully galilee 2 the art 3 the scarlet gospels and of course you know yeah. Going into like more fantastic things like Cabal two and three and the Thief of Always two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we haven't really um, we haven't really like jumped in on something right when it came out before on a novel just because of the timing of our podcast and I mean we talked about when we talked about when on our very first episode we did 2011 in review so we got to talk about you know Aberat three. That yeah, one. but we didn't, yeah. we weren't able to jump right in on it on the launch of it. No, no, we didn't. So it's yeah. going to be exciting whenever some some new book comes out. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be right on it. Yeah. So, and you know, we have some projects that uh, we need to figure out as well. Like we're thinking about doing some commentary tracks at one point. Yeah, yeah. So you know, stay tuned. We might get some commentary tracks done for. For some Hellraiser movies or something like that. Yeah, that would be fun. That'd be very fun. Yeah. It's a little trickier because we're not in the same location. But I wonder, yeah. you know, if we go if we go to uh, if we go to Portland, mm-hmm. maybe we could do something like that there and just record it, you know, on the spot. Oh yeah, I'm really thinking about going to Portland. I'm actually going to look at some. Uh, I'm going to look at uh, uh, trips today and uh, mm. flights and calendars. Michael Plummetis says, Big Nightbreed Cabal Cut phone call in 30 minutes. Thought I would tease you all with that a little. Lol. Phone call with the distributor went well. They are making an offer on the Cabal Cut. Stay tuned. That's good. Well, now we're here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. It, it's great to be able to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, after, after seeing you on the movies uh, so many times over the years, <laughs> right? Especially uh, the Cabal Cut, and uh, well, now we call it the Cabal Cut. It used to be Clive Barker's Nightbreed. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, Catherine, how do we pronounce your last name, Chevalier? Chevalier. 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 Okay. Chevalier. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, because we were we were talking about that if we would would give it the French pronunciation or if it would be like uh, ang- anglified. So uh, yeah. there we go. Always always use the French if you can do it. Uh, so uh, so Catherine, with um, right now you um, you're teaching posture and movement. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. What um, I've been doing for, uh, well, most of my life um, with the acting, I also um, sang, danced. Um, so I was always very aware of the body. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so, through, so through acting and through everything else, now what I'm doing is I've combined <laughs> pretty much um, everything I've learned through my life. Um, and incorporating it in what I'm teaching. So it's a mixture of um, singing, a mixture of imagery, voice work, um, um, you know, just a little bit of a uh, uh, bit of yoga, a bit of Pilates, a bit of uh, Franklin Method, a uh, guy from the States who's very much into bone alignment. Um mm. So pretty much if you know where, you know, your bones are and where they kind of, how they work Mm -hmm. uh, and where they're connected, because we don't really know where our hip joints are usually. Right. Uh, So pretty much if you know where things are in your body, the bones, um, then 
and if you work them properly, then the muscles and the um, the um, ligaments mm -hmm. start to form well around your bones. So we're thinking inside out. Oh, fascinating! Wow. Yes, good stuff. Um, and it's that, and also I've been doing a lot of energy work. Um, so, um, which is energy medicine, which is, uh -huh. much, uh, I don't know if you've heard of like EFT. EFT. I must confess I haven't. No, uh, it's called emotional freedom technique. Oh, okay. So it's pretty much just tapping on certain parts of your body. So it's pretty much like, uh, acupuncture without the needles. Oh, okay. well, I've heard of, uh, I've heard of, um, I used to have a book about, I think they call it digito puncture or something like that. Right. But that was but that was for cats and dogs. Oh. I would, yeah, but I <laughs> I suppose you can use tapping on animals too. So, yeah, no yeah. you can use tapping on anything and you can kind of just realign your energy within your body. So pretty much uh, that's what I've been doing for the last about 5 years, yeah. But, well, first of all, also I would like to say it's great to talk to you finally yeah. because um over the years, uh, you've been in two of the movies that have meant a lot to us uh, as Fly Barker fans, which were Hellbound and uh, uh, Nightbreed, Fly Barker's Nightbreed. Oh, right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, if we could direct the the conversation now towards those movies, um, great. Have you? Are you aware of what's going on with the revival of Nightbreed and the? Uh, the so-called Cabal Cut, which is the director's cut of Nightbreed, coming out? Yeah, I mean, a little bit. Um, I just know that um, pretty much you're just trying to uh, get the the original version, really, instead of all the, you know, the, yeah. the one that, that it came out yeah. was not actually the one that should have been made, pretty much. That's what That's I've right. gathered. What yeah. did you think of Nightbreed when you saw it for the first time? Um, I thought it was, I thought it was great. Um, um, I liked the idea of, um, the, the creatures being, you know, likable. Yeah. Um, you know, which I thought was a great twist on a lot of these, um, so-called horror genres. Um, you know, pretty much you always think the horror, you know, the creepy guy is, is the bad guy. Um, mm -hmm. And killing everything and being, you know, bad. So I, I really enjoyed um, being part of that kind of the twist. Yeah, and sort of the upstanding citizen, the you know the um, the, uh, the doctor psychiatrist. Yeah, the doctor is really the you know the the monster. The monster. Yeah, he's a baddie. <laughs> it's a good baddie because he's yeah. he's Cronenberg. He he was great in the movie. Yeah, so, um, he, he was very good. Um, he was very good, and he's also extremely nice. Um, I mean, I only I only shared a um, um, a car back once with him, but um, no, he's a very cool guy. Because of course, when you're doing a film, you know, when we did a film like that, um, you're never all together at the same time. Right. Uh, right. We, so we all had you know um, different times on set and stuff. So it was kind of you know. Kind of you, just, you shared a lot of scenes with Ann Bobby and Hugh Ross uh, and the, the twins, Kim and Nina? Yeah, and again, um, yeah, we shared them, but um, if you notice, a lot of the times it's kind of the, their shot is shot and then my shot is shot oh, and then they, okay. kind of, then they kind of put it together. Oh, I um, see. Um, yeah, pretty much. It's just the magic of movies, I guess. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. For a long time, I didn't know that there were two little girls. And then uh, only when I <clears throat> started looking into the uh, Nightbreed Chronicles and, and that kind of stuff, then I found out that there were actually two twins. And, yeah. Uh, they are, yeah. Yeah. I wonder, do you know what's happened to them? No, no not really. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if they did any more acting uh, work, just, to be honest. Yeah. I just thought it's always kind of neat to know what happened to these people. And in, in yeah. the ball cut, they actually have lines. Oh, right. Ex exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because in, in, in the theatrical cut, they pretty much, we just see little Babette uh, approaching um, uh, Laurie, and then she gives her the vision of what happened to the Nightbreed. But then, of course, 
in the Cabal Cut, there's that beautiful scene where they actually establish a psychic bond and they communicate with each other. Yeah. That, that was great. Um, very, cool. very cool stuff happening in that film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What was your reaction? Uh, you know, this, this, all the fans kind of like uh, found out about this later, um, that some of the characters were dubbed in the theatrical cut. Yeah. Like, uh, like, like your character was dubbed and, uh, you know, uh, Doug Bradley's character was dubbed. Yeah. So it was a bit, it was a bit weird to, to actually when, um, cause I didn't know anything about it till I saw it. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. it was a bit of a shock when you're, you know, you're looking, uh, expecting to hear yourself and you're hearing this very, I don't know. Um, I don't even, it was a woman, German. I don't even remember it, but, um, it's, I don't know, you just feel a little um, odd that, um, you know, it wasn't your voice. Because I thought my voice was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I've seen the Cabal Cut and, uh, now, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I have an opinion that, yeah, your voice was, was, was great. I mean, and, Cla uh, and Doug Bradley's voice was also very good. Yeah. And I think it's an integral part of a uh, performer's delivery is his own voice because you take the voice away and you're taking away almost half of the performance there. Yeah, I totally agree with you, um, and um, it's a shame that they did that. But um, it like, seemed, it seemed like kind of an effort by the studio to sort of stereotype the characters. You know that Rachel was sort of had this sort of a gypsy voice, and and Lylesburg had a German name, so they gave him a German you know voice. Yeah. Exactly. I think the yeah. I don't know. I don't know whose decision that was, but that was definitely not the right decision. Right. Right, yeah, it made them more uh, having you know having those voices that may not necessarily match their names or their dress made them more uh, human, I think, even though they're night breed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Bobby had a funny story to tell about the um, the voice that was replacing your own voice. She mentioned there was some kind of like. Uh, commercial for coffee at the time on TV, and there was what she called the coffee lady, and it, apparently it was that lady's voice that was used to dub your voice. I, I don't know the name of the voice actor that was used, but that's what Ann Bobby said, that every time she heard Rachel talk in the movie, all she could think about was the coffee commercials. So yeah, that's, that's, a little... that's not Catherine, that's the crazy coffee lady. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't. I'm not too sure who who did it, but mm. it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, you said that in in a, a lot of the a lot of the shots where you're talking to other people were shot separately. Uh, yeah. Did you spend a lot of time working with? I mean, even still, did you spend some time working with like Doug Bradley or Hugh Ross or Ann Bobby? <laughs> Well, yeah, and Bobby, I did um, a, quite a bit just because I think we had that great scene, you know, um, um, when she comes to the door and um, to the door to the, um, you know, where she's saving my my baby, Babette. Yeah. Um, yes. So um, spent some time doing that and shooting that and all that. Um, and um, yeah, I just I thought the whole, the, you know, everybody got on really well. I mean, that's the one thing I remember. Um, and um, the other thing I was remembering is that um, Clive was very, you know, very meticulous about everything looking right. Um, and he spent time, you know, getting everybody just in the right zone. And no, it was great. I, I enjoyed shooting it. Um, you know, it's not something that, uh, you know, the horror films is kind of like it's never been kind of a thing you kind of just go out and, and do. <laughs> it yeah. just you know it just kind of it just kind of happened um but no he's he's um he, he was cool had had you okay. met Clive previously or or was that uh, and kind of a uh, just an audition type of a thing uh no i think no i hadn't i don't know i didn't know him personally no no um but i think i i'm i think i met him um when i did um the mother in uh oh in Hell, was it? hellbound yeah exactly Oh, okay. I met I met him briefly for that, um, but he didn't actually shoot my scene. Uh, there was another guy who was shooting that. Mm -hmm. So, and what was the audition process like for uh, for Clive Barker? I know that we're going back uh, twenty three years ago, but um, 
Ooh, I don't know. I don't. Rem- I just. I just remember reading um, with him, and it was just very, just very, you know, relaxed. I mean, he's he's got a great sense of humor, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and um, it's funny because I have a picture. You probably can't see it because we're not on um, thinking about it. But there's one picture of me with Clive Barker, which I got out of my scrapbook, um, as they say, and yeah. um, it's the kind of. We're both smiling, which oh. it was, it's quite weird because I, as you know, through the film, I hardly smile at all. Yeah. Um, at all. I don't smile. Um, oh, right. But um, it was quite funny. It's just a picture oh. I got here. Yeah. What I might do is I might scan it and send it to you. It's quite oh, a good would, shot. That would be great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we could share that with the uh, people in the Occupy Knitting group. That's, yeah. that's the group that's been... Uh, uh, the movement that was created to uh, push towards the um, the release of the of the uh, cabal cut, and uh, it, there's been restoration work being done by um, the restoration director, who is Russell Charrington. Right. And I think he has been working with, for example, Doug Bradley to uh, restore dubbing his voice over the voice that was um, used, yeah. the German accent voice. So hopefully, maybe in the future, we'll be able to see. Uh, restoration being done to restore the proper voices of the characters from the uh, Cabal movie. Yeah, and That'd maybe and, and maybe mine. You mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That would be great. <laughs> that, would, that would be good. Yeah, no, I I think I'd be into that. I think it would be nice to restore it back. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Mm. Because <clears throat> yeah, because uh, like I said, I saw the Cabal cuts, and now it now it's as it stands, it's got like. Sections where you're, you, we can hear your own voice, and then other sections we hear the other, uh, you know, gypsy Hungary style accent voice, and of course it clashes a little bit. So eventually, I think they will, at some point, they will have to try to fix that. So let's see what yeah. happens. Well, yeah, no, I, I think I definitely, um, if they, I, you know, if, if they need me or something, I'm sure we can uh, come to an agreement. I'd love to maybe get the voice. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. my voice. That'd but maybe, be wonderful. The maybe not like my voice right this second because I got a little bit of a cold, but uh, maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah. it might add something. I don't know. I don't know. You never yeah. know. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. So, uh, <clears throat> and um, what what other projects are you working with right now? I mean, you're, you, you're doing your yoga, Pilates, uh, EFT thing, right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I've been doing. Um, in between, I, I mean, I, I was acting for quite a while, and then um, then had you know the the family, the babies, two boys, and um, then I got into the art. So I started to paint because I've always kind of painted. Oh, uh, so yeah, kind of collage stuff, um, and um, yeah. I don't know. I think pretty much like all this thing. Someone called me a renaissance woman, mm-hmm. uh, you know, trying to dibble dabble in everything and, and, and just enjoying life and, and trying to just keep keep it moving, keep it creative. That's what I say. Absolutely. Is, is yeah, there I mean, a, this... a website or somewhere where we could see your art? Um, well, I had a website and now um, I don't because um, um, I kind of stopped doing that mm. stuff. Um, but uh, not right this minute. But um, I'll keep you posted. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I do have a, I do have a website for my posture movement. But again, I need to you know put a little bit more love into that website too. But well, we, um, we can we'll put that in the in the in the notes for the on our website too, so people can find that. Okay, great. That'd be good. Be good. And what about um, what about the Hellbound movie? Was that was that? I know you just did a brief shot of it. So was that just a brief? Uh, uh, the filming must have been like what a, a day or two or something. Yeah, like I think yeah, even a day. I think it was quite weird because um, it when I saw it again, uh, you know, my face was huge on this huge screen, which I'd never seen. You know, a full-blown face, quite scary to see yourself yeah. Um, yeah. looking looking at you. Um, but uh, And also, I just remember sitting on a chair and then the camera coming in as close as possible. Um, so it was quite quite a, a weird feeling of, of sitting there and saying your lines, and then all of a sudden you got a camera that's in your face. 
And the um, oh, yeah. around your mouth. Yeah, and all that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, but no, it was, it was it was good. It was it was fun to do. It was iconic. I mean, to this day, <clears throat> on the on the uh, Nightbreed movie, you still have a lot of fans out there who really. You know, there's two characters in the movie who fans have fallen in love with. One is Shuna Sassy, the one with right. the thorns, and yes. the other one is Rachel. I mean, oh really? How, how yeah. cool is that? That's yeah. great. Even in when Clive Barker wrote the little backstories for the characters in the book uh, Nightbreed Chronicles, he uh, he had the whole Nightbreed think about Rachel as uh, she's the only beautiful one among the Nightbreed, so they think that. Her beauty is like she's a hostage to beauty and symmetry. So uh, there you go. Ah, cool. I like that. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. And they had you falling in love with a werewolf in, in the backstory. Apparently the, um, there's a werewolf in the movie, and he was supposed to be Babette's father. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Quite, that's quite interesting. Yeah. That was, is... he, was he cute? <laughs> well, yes, I guess I, I you can still see him. I don't think we've seen him as a human. All we've ever seen is the the wolf. Yeah. Yes, we, we only but see when, him but, as. The... But the but was the wolf cute? <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, his name was Toledo. Toledo, yeah. great. Okay. Toledo the wolf. So there you go. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, I, I hope that uh, I hope that you'll be able to make it to some uh, of the screenings. I think there are some uh, screenings being made in the United Kingdom right now. Um, Melbourne, okay, that's Melbourne, Australia. Darlington, UK. Oh, there'll be one in Darlington, oh, UK right. at the Darlington Arts Festival on eighth of May. So there's going to be one there. Uh huh. Yeah. So hopefully you'll be able to make it to one of those screenings. Yeah, I'm sure you'll meet a lot of fans if you do. Uh, well, they're, they're, that'd, be, that'd be good, too. That'd be good, too. It's always nice. Yeah. yeah. And, and we, so, we, yeah. You've, you've, ta- you've spoken with Russell, uh, haven't you? Uh, briefly, okay. um, by email, by okay. email. Um, okay. the, yes, because he, he had um, another showing, I think, happening at the end of April. Right, um, and I think when Remy, uh, when Remy contacted me at that point, it was... It was like right when there was going to be a screening um, the, at that point, so it was it was a little late to try to to try to get that one arranged. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure I'm sure. Yeah, no, I'll be talking with them because again, I'd really I think it'd be good to keep keep the voice consistent because I think if if it, you know if we're gonna if we, like all this you know if you're gonna do it you got to do it right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we'll be looking forward to hearing that. Good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, well, you know, that's great. I mean, we had given up hope on on finding you. Uh, I mean, uh, for the movie and as a fan of the movie, we were always thinking about, well, where are these actors now? What are they doing? Uh, what, where has their careers taken them? And uh, we're glad we're glad to be able to have found you and talk to you a little bit. Uh, that was great. <laughs> Well, thank you. I think it was great. It was great talking with you guys, and um, yeah, we'll we'll get some good voice on the film and get it going. All right. All right. And you know, keep up the creative stuff, and let us know whenever you have like a website or any project that needs to be uh, announced, and we'll do it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. We appreciate that. So this was episode thirty-seven of the Clive Barker podcast, uh, an interview with Catherine, Catherine Chevalier. Uh, you can reach us on the web at www.clivebarkercast.com. Uh, this podcast is on iTunes, if that's not where you're listening to it from. If you want to switch to iTunes, you can do that. Uh, if you're there, please leave us a review. Um, that helps us a lot to know how we're doing. Uh, on Facebook, we have a Facebook page, or you can join the Occupy Midian group. You'll find us uh, very active there. Um, on Twitter, we're at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. And the forum is www.timewinds.com. Actually, no, I'm sorry. They, they, uh, actually, Roger just got a domain name. So the forum is now www.clivebarkerfans.com slash forum. Uh, so anyway, that's it for this episode. Uh, we had a lot of fun talking to Catherine. Um, 
If you have any questions or f- comments or feedback, please leave us a message at one of those places and we'll get it onto the podcast. Why would you get Aberrack without the paintings? That's yeah. like, you know, that's like buying, I don't know, Doritos without the orange stuff.